Today on the RPG Talk Show, we're going to talk about Bob World Builder's survey that he did based on the video that I did. We're going to take a look at Toma Beast 1 on D&D Beyond and what that means for the industry. We're going to talk about some sad news with Larian and their discussion of the future of Baldur's Gate 3 or the lack of future of Baldur's Gate 3. Today, we're going to dive into the topic of ending campaigns. How can we reach a good conclusion for our campaign? And how can we make sure that that ending is as cool as possible? Plus, we're going to cover more questions from the March 2024 Patreon Q&A all to Today on the Lazy RPG Talk Show, I'm Mike Shea, your pal from Sly Flourish, here to talk about all things in tabletop role-playing games. This show, like all of the work I do, is brought to you by the patrons of Sly Flourish. Patrons get access to a dedicated Discord server, the Patreon Q&A, Uncovered Secrets Volume 1 and 2, the City of Arches Sourcebook, and a ton of tools, one of which I'm going to show today, a new tool that I'm offering up to patrons today, uh, that you get for a very, very low price. And you also get to helping me put on shows like this to the patrons of Sly Flourish. Thank you so much for your outstanding support. It is with sad news this week that we learned that Jim Ward, a luminary in the world of Dungeons and Dragons, passed away at age 72. Jim Ward was responsible for a whole lot of interesting original D&D products, Gods, Demigods, and Heroes in 1976. He wrote Greyhawk Adventures, Ruins of Greyhawk. He wrote the adventure that Pool of Radiance was made was made from. I think I heard somewhere that he was responsible for making Gamma World. So lots of different things that he created. And unfortunately, we learned last week that he passed away. I think people were actually expecting to talk to him at GaryCon this week and unfortunately will will not be able to do so. Sad news in the world of tabletop role-playing games. So last week I talked about Wizards of the Coast's kind of bizarre survey where they asked how much we like D&D, do we recommend D&D to a friend, how much do we like Wizards of the Coast? Do we recommend Wizards of the Coast to friends and stuff like that? And I can't. I, I, I started by saying, I'm going to make my own version of the survey so we can actually see the results. And then I was like, hey, you know what? It's really not important. What matters is how we work with our game at our own table, the people we play with and what we decide. It really, how I feel about it and how you feel about it really doesn't matter, right? How... It, how you feel about it doesn't matter to me. How I feel about it doesn't matter to you. What we do at our own games, at our own tables with our own friends, that's what matters. That we should be focused on. So I said, like, it's not worth my time. Bob World Builder thought differently and said, I'm going to make the survey. So Bob World Builder made the survey and hey, good on him. And so I'm talking about here because if you want to take the survey and you want to help him fill out the data so that later on we, we will be able to see the results of this. Bob was very kind to mention my show as, the, as, as kind of a catalyst for this idea. He built a Google survey that you can take. You can, you can hit the Google survey. I'll put a link to the survey and to the video in it so you can take the same kind of survey and one thing i think would be really fun with this survey one thing i recommend you do before we learn the results of the survey there will be no harking what's harking hypothesizing after the results are known one of the biggest problems we have with these sort of like little surveys that we run and little ideas that we run is we just run the poll or the survey without thinking what the results are going to be and then we see the results and we come up with stories about why the results are the way they are that's called harking that's called hypothesizing after the results are known and that's not good science good science and, then, and we'll talk about survey issues in a second don't you get, i know you're already yelling oh mike it's not a representative survey we'll get to that in a minute because it really doesn't matter we're not testing cancer drugs so don't worry about it too much but we'll get to that in a second the other part of it though is that's bad science bad science is getting data and then making stories up about the data you've got far better is you come up with a hypothesis what do you think the answers will be you write that down then you get the survey and then you look at the difference and try to say to yourself huh i wonder why that's different and then if you don't understand why it was different then you run another test with another hypothesis and then another survey that's good science bad science is get data and then come up with stories about the data after you've got the fact so, so here's what we're going to do. And here's what I recommend you do that I think will be fun. Take the poll yourself because those, you can't be wrong with what you're taking the poll. But then when you think about what people are going to answer with, write down what you think the answers will be and then see if you're right about it, right? Then see what did I overestimate or underestimate, but let's get into survey. Let's get into the whole question of the bias of the survey. Obviously, this is not a representative sample of all D and D players in the world neither is the one that wizards of the coast put out though now you could argue well their reach is wider maybe they took it down in a day and bob's going to have this up for a while i saw i put it up on the world and a bunch of people said yeah but this is going to be totally based just on bob's survey results i'm like dudes i just posted it here on the world so that we'd have yours too and he said post it to your group get get your group to do it so i posted it to my three different gaming groups i gave it to them to take out the survey so the best thing we can do is let other people know and let people know who don't know about dd hey we'd like you to take this poll 
poll too. Are we going to get enough of them to sway the results? We don't know. But guess what? We're not going to cash out our 401k and put our money in a new place because of the results of the survey. This is just a bunch of dorks on YouTube channels talking about the results. It'll be fine if the representative sample is not perfect. And all we can do is say, of those that were polled, this was the results. That's what we can say a surety. Whether or not that's representative of whatever population you want it to be is not the case. It won't be, right? However, if your population is all of the people I reached with the survey, then it's representative because that's exactly what you got. So don't worry too much. Get Relax, survey people. We know it's not a representative sample. We're not testing a cancer drug. It will be fine. But more interesting, though, is write down what you think the results are going to be. And you can assume that bias in there. You can assume when you're putting your answers down what the bias is going to be. Because we know, like, okay, this is generally going to be reaching D&D enthusiasts, right? These are people who bother to watch Bob World Builder's channel. It's 150,000 subscribers. There's a lot of people watching Bob World, Bob World Builder, right? But it's okay. So you can keep that bias in mind when you're thinking about what people are going to answer. And then you can look up at your own bias by figuring out what you thought they were going to say compared to what, they actually, what the survey actually did. And I'm going to do it. I'm going to eat my own dog food right now figuratively i'm going to in a we're gonna we're gonna keep a little notion page and we're gonna say bob world builder survey predictions so we have these questions right how do you feel about dungeons and dragons so i've already answered myself and i answered on the last show so i'm not putting down what i think it is i'm putting down what i think people are going to say now do i think that they're going to say what i said maybe i don't know but I'm going to say that I think people love the game. I'm going to think that the people that Bob reached out to, that Bob reached, generally love the game. So I'm going to, I'm going to presume that that's what people are going to say of the, of the surveyed participants. When was the last time they recommended D&D to someone? This is a really, like, month or year. I'm going to say in the past year. Again, this is what I think everyone else is saying. I'm going to say mostly past month slash past year. I'm going to waffle. I'm going to assume that most of the results are going to be in that area and that they're going to be evenly split between month and year. I think that's a fair hypothesis to make. Do I think D&D is becoming less popular, more popular, staying the same? What do I think people think is the real question here. I think people are going to say it's staying the same. I think people are smart and they can do their Bayesian analysis and they can recognize that uh, explosive growth is not always possible. Ah... Uh, Hmm. I'll say more popular because of Legos, Baldur's Gate 3, Converse sneakers. I think people, I think that that's going to be the most likely answer. How do I, how do you feel about the current direction of the game? I think most people that are going to be pulled are probably going to say negative. I think generally people are pessimists and I think people are going to generally say negative. Now, Wizards of the Coast. How do you feel about Wizards of the Coast? I So what I think is interesting about this question is that one question is, how do you feel about Wizards of the Coast? And then another one is, how do you think Wizards of the Coast is becoming less popular or more popular or staying the same? So this is about how you feel. This is about how everyone else feels, kind of. Right? And I think most people are going to be neutral on Wizards. I think people are generally not worried. I mean, like I, we would think it's negative, but I think that it's actually going to be neutral. When was the last time you recommended Wizard Coast product to someone else? I think that's going to be the same as the other answer. I think that's going to be, because it's kind of the same question, right? I mean, magic is, you know, kind of throw thing, throws things off. Do you think Wizard of the Coast becomes less popular or more popular or staying the same? I think that people, I think generally people think it's going to be less popular, but I think the answer is it isn't because I think most people are going to answer neutral. So I think this is the right answer for most people. I think that people believe it is less popular. I think it's one of these where like, well, I don't think so, but I think everyone else thinks this and they all think the same thing. I have the feeling that that's going to be the result. I could be totally surprised, but I, I, I think that, how do you feel about the current direction? I think most people feel negative about it. Now, I think I'm impressing a lot of myself on it. But again, I also think like the groups that we're going to be able to reach out to with the poll, I think probably think negatively. So I think that that result is probably going to be negative. How often do you watch or read content from RPG news or current events? I'm going to guess people are going to say weekly. This is a Bob question, I think. So those are my results. Those, those are what I think people are going to answer. 
What's funny is I think that those are the same as my own answers. So I'm probably impressing too much of myself on the general populace. But what's interesting is I took the survey online. I watched Bob take the survey online and I watched Professor Dungeon Master take the survey online. And almost all of us came to these exact same conclusions. And I think we have different views of the game. So if, if the three of us were coming out with views that were that different... And I, I, I also had some friends that took it and we talked about it. And I have a feeling that this is about right. And to me, the interesting one is I think people generally feel that Wizards is negative, but they themselves are not. I think that's an interesting point. That is a hypothesis. I'm going to put that down as like a, a big, I think that is a, a big surprise hypothesis is that most people feel that most people feel negatively about WotC, but in reality are neutral. Most people are neutral. That's my hypothesis. So and the, what would prove that is that more people would say neutral on question five, but say less popular on question seven. That would that's what would prove what would prove that prove that to me. So so here's what you do. Take the poll yourself and then find a place that you can write down what you think the results will be overall for everybody. And then when the poll comes out, we'll look at it and we'll see how right, right, right we are. And I'll do that on the show. If I'm totally wrong, I will totally admit that I'm totally wrong. That would be really interesting. We'll see. But again, I'm coming back to my core issue on this, which is I don't think it matters that much. It, how everybody feels about the game only matters to Wizards of the Coast. It doesn't matter to us. How I feel about the game, how you feel about the game, how other people, how new people feel about the game versus grizzled veterans feel about the game. The game is so big and so wide and so varied and so, so resilient and so robust that all that needs to happen is I have to get me and five friends together with some books and play around a table. We don't need anything else. So the game has such strength to it that it doesn't matter whether or not the company is loved or hated or whether the game is loved or hated by more people or whether the future direction is good or bad. The future direction really doesn't affect D&D &D that much, in my opinion, that so many people are enjoying like the old school versions of D&D &D now and 5e is so good and so popular overall. I don't know that there's can be that much that does such tremendous harm to it. We'll see. And maybe I'm totally wrong and I eat my, I eat my words. I don't think so though. I think even if the new books come out and even if we don't really like them, and even if they're not well loved, we still have the old books and we can always use those. And there are millions of copies of them out there. So I really don't think how we feel about the brand and how we feel about the company running the brand really matters that much even though I've now spent two segments on two talk shows digging into it. But I think the main lesson we can get from those two segments is it's interesting, but not that important. There's been lots of other news this week about D&D and the brand of D&D that I'm not really going to cover because there's some things that I think, well, it's good that it's bringing people into the hobby and I like that, but it's not really an RPG related topic. For example, Wizards of the Coast and Lego have gotten together to build a new cool Wizards of the Coast Dungeons and Dragons Lego set. That's kind of neat. Uh, you can find news about this online, though. I don't really need to talk about it here. They also are putting out a brand new, I guess they've partnered with Converse, the, t the sneaker company to make a D&D Converse thing. There's like, you know, a new Hawaiian shirt that you can get. Hey, this is the kind of stuff that I want Wizards of the Coast to be doing with D&D. Get the brand out there. Get it out there to people who don't know what D&D is and do what we can to bring some percentage of those people into the hobby so that we can all enjoy the hobby. I have no problems with that whatsoever. I think that's absolutely outstanding. I don't care how schlocky it is. I don't care, you know, as long as it's not actively hurting the brand, as long as it's not hurting the concept of D&D, anything that's getting the D&D brand out there so that people can wear it and enjoy it and play with it and learn about the game is great. We're going to talk about kind of the importance of this when it comes to video games in a minute. Some other piece of news, though, that does does interact with and affect the tabletop role playing game industry is that the Toma Beasts 1 by Cobalt Press, particularly Toma Beasts 1 2023, the, the revision of the Toma Beasts by, from last year is now available on D&D Beyond. You can pick this up on D&D Beyond. You can add this. It is $40 to add this to your D&D Beyond account, and it gives you all of the creatures from the revised Toma Beasts 1. I love the Toma Beast one. I love the revised Toma Beast one in particular. I've done a spotlight of the Toma Beast one before. It is a really cool book of monsters. The monsters are very different from the kinds of monsters you find in the monster manual. They're not your standard fare of monsters. There are 400 of these monsters in the book. So it's really, really cool. That said, I do not recommend buying it on D&D &D Beyond. 
Instead, I recommend buying it from Kobold Press at their web store. You can buy the Tome of Beasts one off of Kobold Press's website. You can pick it up in a bunch of different versions, including a PDF version, softcover and PDF version, hardcover and PDF version. You can pick it up directly from them. This does a few things. Why am I saying you should do this instead of D&D Beyond? One, it gives more money to Cobalt Press. So if you're listening to me, I think, and I'll get into this in a minute, it's outstanding that Tome of Beast 1 is available on, on D&D Beyond, particularly because those people that are focusing on D&D Beyond are going to have access to these monsters that were written by another publisher. That's really, really great for Cobalt Press. It gives a lot of press to Cobalt Press, a lot more press to Cobalt Press. That's great. And it puts more money in their pockets, which means that they can spend more money to make better, cooler products in the future. I'm really good with that. That's really outstanding. However, you're stuck on just D&D Beyond. And if D&D Beyond ever goes down, your monsters go along with you. So a more resilient version of the product is the one that you can pick up from Cobalt Press, where they give you a PDF that you can download to your hard drive. You can stick on a USB thumb disk. You can put that in your safe deposit box. And 10 years from now, you can get it and load it and still have the PDF, regardless of what Wizards of the Coast decides to do with D&D Beyond. You also can buy the physical version. Yeah, I can tell you this. Maybe your version on PDF will last longer than the version on D&D Beyond. The physical book almost certainly will. Physical books can last for hundreds to thousands of years. They will outlive you almost certainly. You buy a physical version of Tome of Beast 1 2023, and you have a physical version that if you care for it, you can certainly keep around for the rest of your life. What Wizards of the Coast or Cobalt Press or anybody else can no longer affect what is in that book. You own it. It is yours. The same is true with the PDF. Obviously, as long as the digital file is still good, that works really well. But you have it in hand versus you are renting it from a website. So my recommendation is instead of picking it up from D&D Beyond, pick up the PDF, pick up the hardcover version. It is an outstanding product, outstanding set of books. I am sure it is absolutely worth their while to sell it on D&D Beyond. And I applaud them for doing so. I applaud Wizards of the Coast for putting it up there. But if you really want to help Cobalt Press out and you want a better version of the product that's going to last longer... Buy it directly from the Cobal Press website. I will link to the Cobal Press website in the show notes. So the other question, though, and I got a lot of this. I got people that asked me this, and I'm not going to spend too much time on it because it's sort of industry versus hobby, but I don't know. I think it's still really important. Is, is this a candle, right? So what are candles? Candles, to me, particularly after last year where there were lots of questions about v- companies acting, behaving well or behaving por- poorly in the realm of tabletop role-playing games, I brought up this concept called candles. A candle is essentially a lit candle is when Wizards of the Coast does something that improves the hobby. A candle that goes out is when they do something that hurts the hobby. Or sometimes there just isn't a candle. Or there's there's a candle that's neither lit nor unlit. It's kind of like a quantum candle where essentially like something is even Steven. So a lot of people said, hey, Toma Beast 1 being on D&D Beyond, that's a candle light, right? And my argument is no, it's probably not a lit candle. Again, it's really good for Cobalt Press. And I take no, I'm throwing no shade at Wizard of the Coast for doing it. I'm throwing no shade at Cobalt Press for putting their book up there. But is it a candle? I don't think so because... It is increasing the, the gravity well of D&D Beyond, and that's run by Wizards of the Coast, and they can change that however they want, and you have no recourse if they do so, right? They can decide to take it down tomorrow, right? You could lose your internet connection and take it down tomorrow. They could block your account for some reason, and you lose access to everything. You know, because it is a hosted service, you really don't have ownership over the material that you buy there. And this is for some people, they're just used to this. They're used to the idea that we give money to services all day long and we lose access to stuff when we no longer pay for the service, that that's the normal course of business. It is not the normal course of business in the world of tabletop role playing games. Most there's only one other company I can think of, and I can't even think of their name who only publishes their material outside of PDF that doesn't release PDFs of their material. Now, Wizards of the Coast does publish PDFs of everything up through fourth edition. They just don't have any fifth edition stuff, very little fifth edition stuff in PDF. You know what would be really cool? You know what would be a candle that's lit? Include the PDF along with your purchase on D&D Beyond. That would be killer. That would be awesome. I would totally talk about i'd be burning a torch instead of a candle well probably not it'd be a candle but like if on dnd beyond you paid your 40 dollars on dnd beyond they said yes now all of your monsters are available on dnd beyond for you to add to your encounter builder and everything else and here's a link so you can download the original pdf of tome of east one 
Holy cow, that would be awesome. Obviously, Cobalt Press doesn't care because Cobalt Press has the PDF available on Drive RPG. They have it available on their own website. The PDF is around. Wouldn't it be cool if, as part of your purchase of Tomobi Swan on D&D Beyond, you also could download the PDF? That would be outstanding. Hey, anybody over at Wizards of the Coast or anybody in D&D Beyond who is listening to this, that would be really cool. I kind of don't know why you wouldn't do that, especially for third-party products. I'm going to call them third-party, even though they're not really third-party, because they're third-party when it comes to D&D Beyond. When... Anytime a third-party product, how about giving them the option of selling the PDF along with the material that's there so people can download it and keep it and know that they have that for available regardless of whether you pull the license. Like, I don't know what the situation is, but let's say Cobalt Press said something really bad or they, they had a rift between their companies. There was some relationship break between their companies. And D&D Beyond said, not only are we going to remove Toma Beast 1 for sale, we're also going to take it out of your library. You can't have it anymore. I mean, could, would that happen? Probably not. Could it happen? Yes. And that's dangerous. So that's why I say it's neither a candle lit nor a candle going dark. I think it's even, right? I don't think it's, it's certainly not bad. The only bad would be like, you could argue that it's making the gravity well of D&D Beyond even stronger, that we're becoming more reliant on D&D Beyond. The more material is there and the more material people buy on D&D Beyond, the more strength D&D Beyond has. You could argue that. I, I talked about how I don't, I, I hold that opinion loosely. I hold that opinion lightly, not strongly. I don't think that that's like a huge risk to the hobby, particularly because you can always buy Tomo Beast 1 in a physical version and you can buy it in a PDF. And I think that's how you should do so. So I don't really think that that's a big issue, but otherwise i don't think it is a thing that is improving the overall 5e hobby nor do i think that it's something that is hurting the 5e hobby i think it's a pretty even move but it was a big move and enough people had asked me about it we talked about it on the sci Flares discord server that i want to talk about it here but tone beast one is excellent i really really love it and i suggest that you go to cobalt press's website and you buy a physical and pdf version of the tome beast one that you can download to your hard drive and have right away and then a physical version that you can give to your heirs for the next thousand years I made a cool thing. So on this show, we do the Patreon Q&A where patrons can ask questions on Patreon. I take, I, I answer all of the questions there on Patreon. Some of them I bring here to the show. And I had built a tool previously called the Talk Show Database. And the Talk Show Database is available to patrons of Sly Flourish. And it is a way for them to do a search on any given topic like Tome of Beasts, right? And they can search all of my show topics to find out which one I have. So I have the Tome of Beasts 1 2023 revision product spotlight was done last Last year at 626, I can click that and it goes straight to the section of the show where I talk about the Tome of Beasts from last year. So this is a feature for patrons to be able to navigate all of the talk show topics, including Patreon questions, theater of the mind, right? I can type theater and I get maps, theater of the mind and abstract maps as a commentary and stuff like that. And it jumps right to the show. However, this database only covers the stuff that I talked about in the show. It doesn't cover every Patreon Q&A that I've done. So this past week, I made a new tool. And that new tool is called the, the Patreon Q&A Database. The Patreon Q&A Database is a it is hosted on Sly Flourish. It is available to patrons of Sly Flourish, but it's also downloadable. So you can download the whole thing to your local machine if you want. Thus, you don't have to worry about me keeping it up online forever because I build these tools to kind of support the thing I was just talking about, which is it'd be nice if you could download it and have it yourself. So if I no longer host it, if Sly Flourish goes down or anything, you always have access to this. And this is a way that you can search all of the questions and answers that I've put on the Patreon. It's 1,700 Patreon questions are available. It's got the questions from people that ask them. It's got the answers. So it talks about like 13th Age is where I became, came to love abstract. So I typed in theater for theater of the mind. You could type in like cipher and it gives you all the questions and answers for the cipher system, right? Anytime I talked about the cipher system, you can, you can talk about that. You could do Numenera. And it gives you gives you a real really fast, as you can see, and it gives you all of the results for any any of the topics that you want. Again, seventeen hundred different Q and A's, Patreon Q and A's that I seventeen hundred specific questions and answers that I've done that are all available. Every time the month passes, I will put the previous months in this database. I've got a quick script that I can run that can pull them down off of Patreon, turn them into the database, and then host them on this database. If you are a patron of Sly Flourish, you can find this in your Patreon rewards page. You go to the rewards page. It's the pinned page at the top of your Patreon rewards. One of them is tools, and under tools is the Patreon Q&A database. You can find it there. I'm also going to be publishing a note to the Patreon, Patreon to remind patrons that they have access to this. You can link 
to it, but you can also download your own copy. So if you ever decide you want to have your own local copy of the Q&A database, you can download your own local copy and keep it there too. I made this for a couple of reasons. One is I think it would be handy for patrons be, to be able to search to find answers to questions that they might already be asking. Cause a lot of times I do get questions that I've already answered or questions that are similar to it. So you can do this search query and you can find similar answers. I also am going to use it myself because many times I answer questions more than once. And it'd be nice to me like I think I answered that before and now I can look it up and get it. One other, a couple of cool features is once you have a, if you have a query you like, and you want to share the query, you can grab the URL. URL string and, and paste it to somebody else so that they can see the query that you ran. But you can also uh, click on a specific answer but by clicking on the ID number. And that looks up just that answer. And then you can paste that. So in our Discord, Discord our Slideflare Discord server, we can pass the URLs of specific questions and answers around as part of it. Again, whole thing is downloadable. So you can, you can click one download. It downloads a directory that has an index.html file. You can run that. It's got all the JavaScript built into it to actually run the search index and to... Um, uh, pull in the data and to run the search. So the whole thing works like that. That is available to patrons of SlyFlourish. It's available to all paid patrons of SlyFlourish, whether you're a veteran or a hero, you can get access to that on the SlyFlourish Patreon uh, page under your rewards page. I thought that was pretty neat. Talking about Wizards of the Coast and D&D and the brand and the spreading of the brand, clearly it was very advantageous to D&D for Larian to make Baldur's Gate 3 tremendous awesome role-playing game i played through twice i think i've got 200 hours in baldur's gate 3 i loved it it's such an outstanding game it was game of the year last year it sold really really well and it did very well for hasbro they did they made a reported 90 million dollars from the license agreement between larian and wizards of the coast for the D D and baldur's gate brand and that was really good because i from my understanding what larian got was access to designers and developers on the D D team particularly about lore who could work with them on checking lore and stuff like that but imagine how much 90 million dollars is in the world of tabletop role-playing games right like that is a huge amount of money like no no rpg product makes 90 million dollars in a year right that is so much think about how many people you could hire to build your role-playing game if you're making 90 million dollars a year on it and um, sadly, Larian has reportedly said that they are not going to be making expansions for Baldur's Gate 3, and they are not working on a Baldur's Gate 4, and that they're probably, the next thing they're going to work on is going to be their own intellectual property. Larian made Divinity Original Sin 1 and 2, which was their own property. Divinity Original Sin 2 is a really, really good game. It was the kind of game that we looked at and said, we, we felt very strongly that Baldur's Gate 3 was going to be good because of how good Divinity Original Sin 2 was. They're going back to that. And it makes sense because you know what isn't a great deal for Larian? Paying $90 million for a license agreement, particularly if they feel like they didn't necessarily need to. So the question is, how valuable was the D&D &D and Baldur's Great brand to Larian compared to how valuable it was for Wizards of the Coast to have the AAA game of the year using D&D? &D? And I wonder where that broke down. We don't know where it broke down, but it's, pro it's certainly Larian not making expansions for Baldur's Gate 3 and Larian saying that they're not going to be making future Baldur's Gate games. That's, that's a bad blow because that brought a lot of people in. My friend Teo Sabadia was at, where was he? He was at a comic convention and he was running like one shot, quick D&D &D games for people. And he said a tremendous number of them came in saying that they had played Baldur's Gate 3, that that was a really good draw to the hobby. And it would have been great if this relationship had managed to stay managed to keep going and and maybe they can turn it around now of course i've heard we've heard hasbro say oh well we're you know we had a lot of success with the licensing of DD for baldur's gate 3 and we have more games to come you're not making baldur's gate 3s over and over again it's really really hard to make a game as good as that it took them years like Three years, four years? How long was Baldur's Gate 3 in early access before it actually came out? A long, long time. You're not going to get a lot of games like that. And you can't just say, oh, we'll just make five more of those, which is unfortunately how CEOs tend to think of things and how they talk about things. Oh, we'll just make more. Obviously, Baldur's Gate 3 did really well. We're going to replicate that. 
you know, good luck. So anyway, that's kind of sad to see. And, and you know, how much Wizards relied upon the $90 million for Baldur's Gate 3, that's that's a big question too. So kind of a, a sad event. Like it's too bad that they couldn't have figured out how to work things out or come to an agreement so that Larian would still be willing to work with it, to still be willing to work with the D&D brand to keep people coming in from the video game side back on the tabletop side so that all of our games are getting more people involved and that would have been really strong. So we will see. Today, I want to talk about ending campaigns. This is a topic that I did a poll and a survey about a while back on how many people actually reach satisfying conclusions of their campaigns. Let's see. Got to find my own thing. So it was a couple years ago when I asked, I, I put out a poll and I asked, how often did people reach satisfying campaign conclusions? I got 2,600 respondents to this poll. And the answers were almost never 26%, rarely 21%, sometimes 31%, often 14%, and almost always 17%. So that means one in five of the surveyed respondents to this poll reach a satisfying conclusion often or almost always. That's not a lot. One in five is not great when it comes to how often you're able to reach a reach a satisfying campaign conclusion. Now, obviously, this is a biased survey. It's the people that answered the poll. I don't know why that would be off from the general population, but even among the people who responded to the poll, that's a lot of people that aren't coming. that are only sometimes reaching satisfying conclusions and almost half the time not reaching satisfying, not reaching satisfying conclusions. So I want to talk a little bit about like, well, what makes a satisfying satisfying conclusion and why don't we why don't we reach that so there's, there's actually a couple of angles on this and a couple points that i want to make the po point number one is how do we make our game reach satisfying conclusions at all and then what are those satisfying conclusions actually like so one is how how can we get to a satisfying conclusion i have a few things that i think have helped me reach i have run more than two dozen campaigns in the past 10 years that have reached satisfying conclusions my wife and i were talking about it and i can only think of one campaign that i ran where we stopped in the middle and didn't finish it out of like 25 campaigns i have three ongoing campaigns right now and they're all going to reach conclusions i'm pretty sure so how did i make that happen what 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 luck did i reach that I'm able to do that. And some of it is luck. But one of them is making a robust group. So what is that? So a robust group in my mind is when you have six regular full-time players and two on-call players, and you will run the game even if you only have four players. So I think a lot of groups, and I've heard this, a lot of groups have like five players. They only have five players. And the game only happens if all five players can be there. That is a very brittle game. That means that that game is probably going to happen less than the times it's not going to happen. You need a significant, if instead you say, we are going to run if we have enough people to be able to run. And in my mind, that's about four. You could even go down to three, but at least having four people. Now, ideally, you also have you, you also extend that group so that up to six people can be in the group and you'll still play. So you have a flexible range of like four to six people. That way it takes three people dropping out before you can't have a game. But then you can also say we're going to have a couple of people that I could call who can jump into the game if we want to keep the game going, even though we know we have more people out. And if you can find two people like that, these are people who are not able to commit to the full game or, or you've come to an agreement to that you recognize the fact that they are an on-call player. Hey, we have six people already, but if you're willing to come in and sit in from time to time, I can put you on the on-call list and when we have a seat for you, I'll call you. So I've got one of these in my Wednesday group, for, for example, that when, I, when somebody is out, I send them a text and say, hey, do you want to play? We have a seat free. And sometimes he says yes, and sometimes he says no. If, I, if you have two people like that, it takes five people to not show up for you to not have a game right? That you can have up to four people say that they can't make it and you can still run the game. It takes five people not being able to make it before that game. That's called, that's a robust group, right? When you can run a game, even if five, even if four people drop out, you can still run the game. That, that's, that, that means you're going to have that game many more, much marker. That means you're going to have the game much more often than you're not going to have the game. 
Now, another thing is having that game at a regular time of the week and doing it weekly. So I have two of my games are weekly games. They are three hour games, so they fit a little bit easier to the schedule. Four hour game is a little bit too hard, but a three hour game seems to fit really well. And they're at the same time every week. One group, we schedule it, but we almost always schedule it for every two weeks. And it's either a Friday or Saturday. And we do check with everybody that's in a game. Hey, can you guys make it? We try to find the one that most people can make it. But if we have people that are generally out, we just pick one of them as long as we have four people that are able to play. So making your game strong, making your group strong, and that it's able to play even if you have people that aren't able to make it is one way to make sure that you can run a campaign that actually reaches the ending. But how do you make that ending actually good? So this is the second part of this conversation. What can you actually do to make sure that this the ending of your campaign is a strong ending? And there are a few things that you can do and a few ideas that I think you should keep firmly in mind when you are working on this ending. Some of them are philosophical and some of them are specific. So one of the philosophical things, give them the ending they want. Now, you might be familiar. There are, I mean, there are TV shows on both sides of the spectrum. I'm a big fan of like serial TV shows. Some serial TV shows give you the ending they wa- that you want. Breaking Bad had a really good ending. The ending didn't make a lot of sense given the way the rest of the show went, but it, it was what you wanted to have happen. Other shows, I'm not going to mention them because I'll just get comments telling me that I'm wrong. But there are other very popular shows where they had twisty, turny endings where there were great big surprises at the end. Ways that the whole story changed at the end. And I found them very unrewarding because I had things I wanted to have happen. The audience had things that they wanted to have happen and they just didn't happen. And then you're left with like, you know what would have been cool? Having that thing happen that was that you were leading towards. So... What are the you you want to have like good endings that make sense that are the things that the players have been driving for? Don't be crafty and weird with the story. Give them what they want. And how do you know? Ask them. When you get close to the end of the game, say, what are you really looking forward to for the end of this game? What, what, are you, what are you excited about? Hear from them. Listen to them. Get an understanding of what you, you think they're excited for. Write it down in your notes. And then when you're getting ready to do your conclusion, give them that conclusion. Give them the conclusion they want. Don't change the story around in all kinds of weird, twisty ways. Don't make it turn out that the guy that they've been working for the whole time is actually the main bad guy. Don't make the main bad guy suddenly like, oh, no, I'm on your side. There's actually this other thing. Don't twist and turn the ending don't have one of your players turn out to be betraying the rest of the characters all of these ideas about how to like turn things on their head don't turn things on their head at the conclusion of the game give them the conclusion that they want now a lot of times in our fantasy role-playing games particularly in our what we call f20 games fantasy d20 based role-playing games like your pathfinders and your 5e's and your other sort of action combat sort of high fantasy role-playing games is you're going to have a big boss fight right you're one of the things you have at the end of the game video games do this all the time the big boss fight right so how do you tune that big boss fight to make sure that it is both really fun to play but also challenging and if your characters are high level it gets harder to do but there's two things that you can kind of keep in your mind and it's interesting because they're two divergent things they're two opposite things that you need to keep in your mind at the same time and work towards one of them is making sure to design the battle to show showcase and highlight all of the cool abilities that the characters have their biggest cool abilities you want to make sure that there are monsters or situations that benefit from the things that the players love doing best with their characters show off those cool power powerful abilities let them do the thing that they really love doing get that part in there that's one side of it the other side of it is making sure that you are challenging the players by having certain creatures that are not able to be affected by their big thing particularly save or suck spells or getting attacked by tons of damage at the time or being able to mitigate all the damage they do you're 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 there are ways that the characters particularly high level characters are able to mitigate a lot of the threat of a battle and you want to make sure that while some of the battle is able to be fully affected by those situations big guys that they're able to tank and not take any damage or dudes that they're able to banish or big hordes of monsters are able to blow up with a single fireball or a bunch of creatures they can knock out with a hypnotic pattern you want to have those creatures in there but your big boss and maybe a couple of sub boss or things like that they shouldn't be affected by those things the same way how do you know what those abilities are 
Well, you know because you can run test battles. So as the characters are getting closer to the final battle, try running a couple of test battles that are similar to what you're thinking about for the boss fight with a different theme and different focus and different stakes and everything like that. But show you what the characters are capable of. Recognize, ah, that person has a crazy high armor class and a way to grant disadvantage on all attacks. It's going to be really hard to do damage. Keep that note, right? Oh, that person really loves to just grab people and throw them in pits or throw them over the wall or throw them somewhere. Okay, that's good to know. This person has spells that are able to lock down really big creatures. Okay, that's good to know. Know what those things are. And by knowing those things, by running these test battles ahead of time, that gives you the answer to both of those two questions. What are the things they love doing that I want them to be able to highlight in a fight? And what are the things that they are, are going to try to do with the boss that aren't going to work? Then when they're actually fighting the boss, make sure it's clear to them that those things aren't going to work. Like you look at this boss and realize this legendary foe is not likely to be controlled with your crazy control spells. Don't let them blow spells trying to do something that you're going to circumvent with some particular monster feature. Now, if that feature is really clear to them, if they got warning that they have that and they blow a spell anyway to try it and it doesn't work, you can tell them that. But generally speaking, you want it to be clear to them. If you're putting in like special weird mechanics that they wouldn't recognize, but are preventing them from being able to do the thing that they'd want to typically do with that monster, warn them ahead of time so they're not wasting their time. I think that that's important. So there's lots of tricks for making sure that your boss fight is going to be a good threatening fight. The other piece, another piece of running a good boss fight is waves of combatants. Throw waves of combatants at them. Instead of having one big fight where everything's already on the table, have a few waves hit them first. So you have a wave of minions. And, and I like to think there's three types of waves of minions that I, or waves that I really like. Uh, you could do four different ones. You can decide which ones you want to do. One is a uh, normal group of monsters where you have roughly one monster per character that are pretty powerful, powerful enough to challenge a single character that they can be handled with crowd control. You can hit them with limited area effect spells. They can throw out damage. They can take damage, but they will eventually drop. So that's essentially the one monster. They call it like the wolf pack. The wolf pack is like one monster per character. Then you have the horde. The horde is where you have like four monsters per characters, big piles of monsters come tearing out low hit point, low damage, usually some of ability to at least make it a successful attack so you have this big waves of combatants, big piles and don't spread them all out don't be all funky and tactical and try to avoid the fireball have them come in in a 30 foot radius or 20 foot radius block so that they can throw a fireball right out and blow them away that's what you want to see that's what they want to do let them get hit by areas of effect lean in towards the character options let them blow those hordes away because it's really cool that's really hardly a threat but it's a way for them to throw spells around to move around it's a way for them to see their big effects it's a way for them to wade in and kill lots of combatants that are pretty easy so that's another good wave is the wave the horde of combatants then you have the big brutes now the big brute wave is essentially one monster for every couple of characters you can figure out the challenge ratings using like the lazy encounter benchmark and stuff like that one big monster per for every couple of characters that can be affected by control spells so they might get charmed they might get dominated that might get banished they might get stuck in force cages you can do things to block them away but they hit so hard you, you better control them because they will hammer you if you don't Right. So that's another wave. And then you have your boss and the boss is usually legendary. If they're if the characters are above seventh level, you almost always want to run a legendary monster that has legendary resistances. You sometimes they might have sub bosses with they might have sub bosses with them. Sometimes they might have sub bosses with them. They might have another couple, especially if you have more than four characters, you probably want to have one sort of sub boss and a sub boss could be just a normal monster. It doesn't even have to be one of the big brutes. It could be like a monster that's roughly the equivalent to one of the characters. But if you have six characters, you might want to drop two to four of those guys in on top of your boss. So there's something else that they have to worry about. And then you have your boss and then the boss, you're probably going to want to customize to be able to deal with the really hard controllery things that that the characters do examples would be if they spike damage maybe the boss can spread damage to one of their minions instead of taking it themselves or if they get hit with debilitating attacks they can move that debilitating attack over to one of the other creatures that they have out there obviously legendary resistance is a way to deal with saving throws and things like that and then likely you want to give them a way to be able to get themselves advantage on attacks because players have lots of ways characters have lots of ways to grant disadvantage on attacks examples are you know dropping like a darkness on the whole room so nobody can see anything going improved invisible would be another one drawing unholy energy from a powerful artifact that give, grants them advantage on attacks that kind of thing you want to give them ways to be able to deal with all of the defenses and the capabilities 
abilities of the characters so that the boss is actually threatening. Now, you're not really like you don't want to overdo it and you want to make sure it makes sense in the story because you don't want players to feel like you're screwing them by getting rid of all of their abilities. But at the same time, they'll recognize like, yeah, I guess I shouldn't expect to be able to cast dominate monster on the boss. Right. Or I guess I shouldn't expect that he can put himself in a force cage and never get out of it. Of course, he's got to teleport. Right. Of course, he's got things that can get around it. So think about what the ways I still think like big bosses should be able to grab force cages and rip them right open. Right. And the players are like, what? Now, maybe if a boss rips a force cage open, you can see that shredding their own flesh. So they take a bunch of damage instead of dealing with the force cage. There's lots of like tricks for how to design boss monsters. Forge of foes. We have lots of discussion of this kind of thing, but those are ways to make your boss monster fun. The final thing for ending a campaign is once they've beat the boss, once everything is concluding, turn it around to the players and say one year passes. Where is your character? I love these one year tales. My players love these one year tales one year after the end of the adventure, where do we find their character? And this is your opportunity to hand the story over to the players completely because you don't care where they're going to go with it because it's their story now. And they love it because they get to get the exact conclusion that they wanted because it comes right out of their head. You're not telling them what happened to their character. They get to say what happened with their character and you get to write it down and kind of share it and all the other players get to share like where the characters went. Sometimes it's in really cool places. Sometimes it's really dark places. But the player is the one that's responsible for coming up with a conclusion of where their character's arc ends. And that is a fantastic way to end a campaign. It's really easy for you to do as a GM. You don't have to prep anything. And you can still, and, and almost every time, I think every time, I've loved the stories that they've come back with at the table. So I hope those are some good tips for how to reach an ending, uh, reach a campaign conclusion and also how to run a campaign conclusion and the kinds of things you want to avoid and the kinds of things that you want to focus on when you're doing your campaign conclusion. Every week, every month on the Sly Flourish Patreon, we have a monthly Q&A. Anybody can put up a uh, RPG related question on the Q&A thread and I answer every one of them every Friday and I bring some of them to this show and some of the other ones become catalysts for articles or newsletters. I also now have the Patreon database, Patreon Q&A database. So you can go look up, patrons of Sly Flourish can go look up any of the previous questions or answers that I've given in years past, months to years ago. Bram B says, I've never laughed as much in a session as my last session of Curse of Strahd. What are your thoughts about joking around at the table? We all know players like to make fun of names carefully crafted by the DM. DMs also sometimes have a silly shopkeeper or ludicrous villain. However, However, I've had times where my own DM asked us to joke around less at the table as he didn't enjoy us not taking it seriously. Should a DM be the straight man to the PC's wacky hijinks? Do you break the fourth wall as a DM or player? What are your expectations at the table when it comes to jokes and comedy? I lean in on the comedy big. If my players are having fun, I'm having fun. If they're making jokes, I'm making the jokes with them. I've definitely had serious villains that turned into slapstick villains because of something they say. I break the fourth wall all the time. I will have villains talking about the fact that they rolled poorly and that they're really angry at themselves. I, 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 I love doing that kind of thing. I don't take the game very seriously. I really enjoy that sort of part of it. We still have a good story. There's still lots of drama that goes on. There's still characters, that NPCs that characters love. There's still conclusions that are going on. But I, I lean into the story. However, I do know that there are definitely DMs who want a, a feeling of a game to be different. And I think probably the best way to handle that is through out-of-game conversations kind of talk about what your intention is for this and work with that. There is one area where I think that sort of too much comedy can actually be uh, detrimental to a game. And it's when we use comedy as a defense mechanism against the actual core of the game. And what I mean is that like we're all sitting around a table playing a game that we might have played when we were 12 years old and we get self-conscious about that. And there's a it's a defense mechanism for us sometimes to say like we're going to make a joke because we don't want to get too serious about a game that's just make believe. And that's unfortunate because we should be comfortable having serious drama in a, a, a game that we're just playing with our friends and we should let ourselves we should we should break down those defenses and not use comedy as a defense for the actual fun of it and sometimes there are ways that we can sort of subconsciously or through body language or through the way we respond to things to kind of let players know like yeah i know you were joking but let's get serious here sometimes you might actually have to break character and have a conversation and if you think like in the last in a previous game or something like that that things have been a little bit too boisterous you know you could say like hey i just want to talk to you guys about this game i know we're all having a good time we're all laughing about it 
but also like one of the things I think could be really fun for this game is for you guys to really think in your characters. You're, you're in your characters. You're in this terrible city that's run by a ghoul Imperium and you're at this spot where you're going to be able to help them. And these people really need your help. So, you know, while we're playing the game, really get in the heads of your character, not just by like the funny bits, but like focusing on what they really think and then see if you can help work with them a bit. It's almost like acting class a little, right? You get them into the heads and see how they take. And maybe they're not that interested. And if they're not, then they're not. And, and you know, you don't get to decide how they get to feel about things. They don't get to decide how you feel about things. But maybe you can have some of those conversations to get you guys into it. So I don't think it's quite so easy as just saying some tables are just a, a joy, a joy, a, a boisterous laugh and other ones are dead serious. And but when there's a divergence, when some characters or players are serious, when some aren't. So one thing is if you have one player who is very serious and other people are joking, you might shut the jokers down when the serious players say, just hang on, let them finish. Right. Or when you're role playing with them, don't jump into comedy just because you might feel that defense mechanism. Roll with it and let the drama kind of come out. Because I think that, yeah, good drama probably happens a lot less frequently at a table than good than comedy does, because I think we're more comfortable with comedy and we use it as that defense mechanism. So I think that's something to keep in mind. Really good question. Thank you for that. Luke B says, fantasy economy has always seemed arbitrary at, the, at best, badly broken at worst. I have yet to find a system with an economy that makes any sense. Do you know of one? How do you figure out what things should cost and how much money to reward your players with? I've toyed around with the idea of treating silver pieces as if they were dollar bills, American, making gold pieces $10 and platinum pieces $100 bills. At any rate, when selling prices, I ask myself, what would this perhaps cost in dollars in 2024? Doesn't seem like the best system, but it's all I've got and I'm open to suggestions so i'm gonna i'm gonna answer this question in reverse order i actually have been thinking about this and my question was like how much is a gold piece actually worth is there some way that we can talk to our players about defining how much a gold piece is worth and i think the answer is yes it's not a perfect one because obviously the fantasy world that that we're playing in and the world of our real world are very very different but we could still kind of get close and i think the answer is about 100 to 150 dollars per gold piece and the way i come to this conclusion this is a very american centric definition of like measuring that economy different parts of the world are going to have vastly different economies of scale but i think like pretty much for us and if you were to convert us dollars into like euros and 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 gbps and stuff like that i bet you it's roughly close and the way we figure this out is with a little bit of math so what we can figure out is that the median income for an individual in the united states is roughly sixty thousand dollars Right. So that I think I, I, I looked that up and I think it's right about $60,000 is the median household income. We're not going to get into the politics of like, was that good or is that bad or whatever? But that's the way it is. And for somebody to make 60000 a year, they generally work 2000 hours. Right. So then per hour, we have 60000 divided by 2000 is $30 an hour. Right which is how much per day they work eight hours in a day. 30 times eight is 240. So they earned about $240 in a day. And so now how do we convert that to gold? If you look in the 2014 Dungeon Master's Guide, they say that a skilled professional costs two gold pieces per day, right? So you can actually divide 240 by two, 120. And that is roughly, if you were talking about a skilled individual, if you're comparing a skilled individual that you would hire in D&D to the median household income of, or median income of somebody in the United States, uh, and presume that those two are equivalent, which again, we're off a little bit. It's about $120 per gold piece was about the amount. So you can roughly, you can roughly get that to $100 a gold piece. If you want to think about what a gold piece is worth and you want to kind of use, you know, $20, $24 as an answer, thinking, I think you could be worse by thinking of it as $100 is a gold piece is worth about 100 bucks. If you decide that $100 is either too low or too high, you can have choice change. It could be $200 per gold piece if you wanted to. So you could go with that. Now, going back up though, you say you've never had an economic system that makes sense. So I'll offer a couple things. One is the Level Up Advanced 5e Trials and Treasure Book actually includes gold piece values and the materials you would need to make magic items. So you can see how much a magic item is worth in gold pieces in the Level Up Advanced 5e Trials and Treasure Book. So that gives you a bit of an economy. And then another trick is like when they're going to places to buy and sell magic items, don't let them have access to a whole bunch of them. Instead, roll randomly on the chart a few times and give yourself um, a set of magic items that are available. But you can use those prices as a baseline for the magic items that are available in Level Up Advanced, v's, level up advanced 5e's Trials and Treasure. I think that can work really well. 
Mr. Parsnip says, I'm a little confused when it comes to the deadly encounter benchmarks. Say my player's benchmark is six and there are three encounters upcoming in a session dungeon. How do I throw, do I throw three times two of my players or three times six? So you bring up an interesting point. The, the lazy, the, the, the lazy encounter benchmark as I've heard, I've, I've referred to it as the deadly encounter benchmark or the lazy encounter benchmark. I, I've now been going to the lazy encounter benchmark because it doesn't always benchmark deadliness is for one battle. So it's not intended to be an economy that you would use for a number of battles across your across like an adventuring day. I actually we, we do offer some suggestions in Forge of Foes about handling the numbers of adventures, a number of battle in an adventuring day. Obviously, the DMG has some guidance on it. I actually don't firmly believe that that's a great way to look at it. Instead, you should run whatever number of battles meets the pacing and the fun of the game and makes sense in the story. So have small battles when it makes sense to have small battles, have bigger battles when it makes sense to have bigger battles. Run, if you think like, wow, they just went through a bunch of big battles, it's time for a small battle, go ahead and do that. So don't worry too much about trying to build a budget for the total number of encounters in a day. That's hanging on, in my opinion, hanging on to things too tightly. And instead, you should let the story... The two driving factors in determining encounters during a day are what makes sense for the story and what makes what will make the game fun for the current pacing. Because sometimes it's really fun for them to fight a small skirmish against just two or four people. And sometimes it's fun for them to fight a great big battle. Sometimes they'll trigger both. Sometimes they'll trigger a small battle. Sometimes they'll trigger a great big battle. You want to run with that. The benchmark is really there to just tell you, is this getting in an, un, unintentionally deadly? Did I throw so many monsters out there that they're really not going to stand much of a chance and then i want to know that ahead of time either to tune the battle or to just give them the right warnings that they maybe they need to run it's just a way for them to, to gauge that to, to gauge that idea if you want to learn more about what the deadly encounter benchmark is rather than reciting it over i'll po post a link in the show notes so you can see that oh what the hell i'll give the benchmark so the lazy encounter benchmark is a quick way in your head of determining whether a battle might be inadvertently deadly a quick way to get the benchmark in your head is to add up all of the monster challenge ratings of all of the monsters that you have. So if you have five CR3 monsters, that would be 15 total monster challenge ratings. And then compare that to either one quarter of the sum total of character levels or one half of the sum total of character levels if they're fifth level or above. Again, I link to the article so you can see that. If the sum total of monster challenge ratings is greater than one quarter of the total of character levels or half of the character levels, if they're fifth level or above, you might be into deadly territory. That means it's going to be a pretty tough fight. Now, what about easy fights? You don't have to do a bunch of crafty math. You could just say, well, if it's significantly less than that number. And the way to get that number is just, if you want to know what the benchmark is, take I'll add up all the character levels together and then either divide them by four if they're under fifth level or divide them by two if they're above fifth level. And that gives you a number. And then if the total number, the total monster challenge ratings is greater than that number, you're in the red. If it's below that number, it's going to be easier. And then the further below it is, the easier the battle is going to be. But you shouldn't use that as a budget for managing an entire day's worth of battles. You should be looking at each battle independently. And many times you don't even need to do the benchmark. You already know it's going to be less. And you're building it based on the story rather than worrying about the total challenge rating. A lot of DMs never even calculate challenge rating. They just throw monsters and see what happens. But if you want to have just a loose gauge you can keep in your head add all the character levels together divide them by four and that is the benchmark for the total number of monster challenge ratings for monsters below four divide it by two for the ones if the characters are fifth level or above Friends, I want to thank all of you for hanging out with me today while we talked about all things in tabletop role-playing games. If you enjoyed this show, please consider subscribing to the Sly Flourish newsletter. You'll get a weekly RPG-related email sent to your inbox with links to all of the work I do. You'll also get a free adventure generator for signing up, and it's absolutely free to sign up. All you need to do is give me your email address. There's a link for that in the show notes. You can also support me directly on Patreon. Patrons get access to all kinds of tools, all kinds of exclusive adventures, the City of Arches sourcebook, dedicated Discord server, the Patreon q and lots and lots of stuff and the new stuff coming oh i got awesome things to talk about later that patrons are getting but patrons get access to all kinds of stuff and you can pick up any of my books at the sly flourish bookstore all of those links are in the show notes thank you so much have a great day and get out there and play an rpg